So hi everyone, in this video we are going to discuss another example of a round robin or RR na CPU scheduling with time quantum 20. What it means is each process will be given a chance to execute for 20 milliseconds before it gets preempted and um, switched to another process. So we have four processes. P1 to P4 in the same order of arrival. So assuming that these processes have arrived at time zero also. So the burst time for P1, P2, P3, P4 is shown 53, 8, 68, and 24. Since we have not started execu executing these processes for yet, the remaining time is similar to the burst time. Okay, so now let us begin by visualizing how this processes will be executed given the round robin. So since P1 has arrived first, so it will be executed for 20 milliseconds and the remaining time would be 53 minus 20, so 33 na milliseconds. Now, after P1, P2 will be executed and then P2, um, is also given 20 milliseconds. But since it has a burst time only of 8, so it gets to complete at the 28th immediately and the remaining time is 0. So we basically remove this from the queue since P2 is done with its execution. Now we move to the P3 and the P3 uh, is also given 20. So we have a remaining time of 48. So 68 minus... 20, we have a remaining time of 48. After P3, P4 will be executed. And since uh, still uh, P4 is also given 20 milliseconds, so 24 minus 20, we have a remaining time of 4 for P4. And we are done here. Since it is circular, we will go back to P1. So P1 will execute for 20 milliseconds again. So 53 minus uh, 20, we have 13 na remaining na burst time. Then we'll skip P2 and then the P3 gets to execute. So we have 20, uh, we have 28 na remaining time. Then P4 gets to execute for 4 seconds, milliseconds, I mean. And now P2 and P3 are done. And we are going back to P1. So P1 will be given 20. But since it has a remaining time of 13 milliseconds only, so it gets to complete at um, 1 25th. And we are left with P3 with 28 na remaining time. So first it will be given 20. And then since there are no more processes, then P3 gets to execute again. Okay, so the total na um it all of the processes have completed at the 153rd na time period. Now, what would be the waiting time for each na process? Okay, so the waiting time is the time wherein uh, that certain process has to wait before it gets to execute again. Okay, so in this case, the P1 has um, a waiting time of 72 milliseconds. So how did we arrive to that? So First, the P1 gets to execute for 20 milliseconds, right? But then um, it gets preempted and that P2, P3, and P4 have to execute for some time. So we have to uh, get that time interval that the P1 is waiting before it gets to execute again. So that is from the 68 minus 20 plus 112 minus 88 because at this period after P1 executed for some time, P3 and P4 got to execute again. So we have to get this time that P1 is waiting. Okay, so at this time, the P1 already got to complete its executions or meaning there is already no uh, zero na remaining time for P1. So we don't have to include these parts. Okay, so the P1's waiting time is 68 minus 20 plus 112 minus 88. What about for P2? For P2, it gets to wait only for 20 na milliseconds. Okay, so you can see here that um, after P1 gets to execute, P2 already got its turn. So that is 20 minus 0. And then at this period, since it says only a burst time of 8, it already completed its execution at this period. Okay, 
And for P3, um, we have 28 minus 0 because before P3 got to execute, P1 has to and P2 have to execute first. And then after P3 got to execute for a few um, milliseconds, P4 and P1 got to execute for 48 minus uh, 48, 88 minus 48. Then um, 125 minus 108. So we basically have to compute only or to sum up only those periods that P3 do not, did not execute. Okay. And how about for P4? Um, sorry, I have a mistake here. Mm. Okay, so for P4, it has to wait for P1 to P3 to execute before it got its turn. So that is 48 minus 0. Plus, um, before it got to execute again, P1 and P3 had to execute for some time. That is 108 minus 68. So the it sums up into 88. So to compute for the average waiting time, we simply have to add this all up the waiting time for each process divided by the total number of processes. Okay, and that is 66 and one fourth. For the average na completion time, so assuming that all of the processes have arrived at time zero, so to complete, to compute for the turnaround time, another term, turnaround time, we simply have to subtract the time that a process has completed its execution minus its arrival time. So let us see for P1. When did P1 uh, complete? So P1 got to complete at 125th na time period minus 0 since it arrived at 0. And for P2 got to complete its execution at this period, 28th. So 28 minus 0. And then um, for P3, P3 completed its execution here at the 153rd na time period. So 153 minus 0. And the P4 got to complete its execution in this period. So 112 minus 0. That is also 112. And to uh, solve for the average na turnaround time or completion time, we just have to add all of the turnaround times for each process divided by the total number of process, which is equal to 4. And this results to 100 na 4. Okay. So um, how do you choose the time slice? Well, uh, that would depend on um, that's that would depend on the processes that we have. So if the time slice is too big, then the response time suffers also. So what does it mean? So if uh, for example, you gave a time slice of 50 milliseconds. So in order for you to get a response for P2, you have to wait for 50 milliseconds. That is compared to, let's say, you give a only a 10 milliseconds. So after 10 milliseconds, you already get a response for another na process. And then uh, what if it is infinite? So we better uh, go back to the original or the simplest na algorithm, the FCFS. Okay, and But if the time slice is too small, naman, then the throughput will suffer as well. So for example, compared to 10 milliseconds versus 100 milliseconds. So um, if sobrang liit ng time slice, we have to wait for a long time kasi there will be a lot of switching and preemption. There will be a lot of interruptions until um, before na mak makakomplete ng isang process. So how many times are we going to uh, interrupt one process, di ba? So, um, mag si switch lang ng mag si switch hanggang sa matapos lahat. So walang wala wala tayong ma ano ma matatapos agad na process. So maliit lang yung number of process that will get completed. So the throughput will be suffering. So initially, in the Unix na time slice is one second, but it worked okay when Unix was used by one or two people. But let's say if there are three compilations going on, so there will be three seconds to e echo each na keystroke. 
So in practice, we need to balance the short job performance and the long job na throughput. Okay, and the typical na time slice is between 10 milliseconds to 100 na milliseconds. And the uh, uh, typical na context switching overhead is right when we are switching from one process to another. So there will be an overhead. So that would be 0.1 to 1 millisecond. Okay, so that is roughly 1% na overhead due to context na switching. Since na, di ba, when we are switching processes, we have to load the PCB, save the state, and then load another PCB of another na process. So that would uh, give us some context switching overhead. Okay, 